Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to our distinguished guest, Juan Manuel Santos, President of the Republic of Colombia, and to all of you at this World Leaders Forum event. Thank you, Mr. President. He will be here shortly for making the time to join us here, probably the only place this far from home uh, where you can address such a large group of Colombians. I want to alert our audience uh, to the fact that after President Santos' address, there will be a panel discussion, including Ambassador Maria Emma Mejia, Professor Maria Victoria Murillo, Professor Christopher Sabatini from SIPA, and also Professor Jose Antonio Ocampo from SIPA, a former Colombian cabinet minister and UN official now in the, school of our, uh, now in the faculty of our School of International and Public Affairs. The purpose of the World Leaders Forum is to foster free exchange of ideas and to promote informed dialogue on the issues of our time. Occasionally, the stars allow us, the stars align to allow us to hear from a world leader at a moment of great historical importance for his or her country. This is one of those special occasions. Following President Santos' re-election last year, Thousands of his supporters gathered in Bogota to celebrate. They stood together, arms raised with the word paz, or peace, emblazoned on the palms of their hands. It was a stirring and fitting image, speaking to an impassioned dream of the Colombian people that had eluded the nation's leaders for decades. Mr. Santos made this goal the defining promise of his presidency, and now, Quite remarkably, it appears that Paz will be his lasting legacy, for Colombia stands on the cusp of concluding a peace agreement with the country's leftist rebel group, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. The most intractable internal conflict in the Americas during our lifetime has been the violent struggle in Colombia between government forces and the FARC. The accumulated death, death toll and the number of people uprooted by this fighting are staggering. The conflict has deeply affected every aspect of Colombian life. And here we stand, just a matter of days after a landmark agreement to end these hostilities. Among the agreement's notable achievements is an innovative approach to transitional justice already recognized as a potential model for resolving other conflicts. Let me conclude this introduction by reading something that President Santos said to the UN General Assembly yesterday. Peace is difficult to achieve, but it is not impossible. Peace is more than the fruit of a political, social, and economic pr process. Peace is, above, else, above all else, a great and collective cultural transformation that begins with a personal, spiritual change which requires every individual in themselves to open their mind, heart, and soul to reconciliation. Please join me in welcoming the President of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos. Thank you very much, Mr. Cotsworth, and thank you all for being here. I prepared a long lecture, quite a few pages, but I thought that uh, it would be much more interesting for you to hear how this peace process that, uh, we're, that we're about to end, hopefully, uh, was made, how the details of how it, it started. So uh, I will leave this to you. I will simply read the conclusion, which is a good resume of what I wanted to say. It says, uh, leadership is about doing our best effort to make better the life of our people. Leadership is about doing whatever you have to do to end the war, any war. Leadership is about 
taking risks to do what you believe in your own heart is the right thing to do. In the end, if perhaps you walk away with one idea, is that responsible leadership in today's world is about being pragmatic, being able to combine ideas from the left or the right to help create prosperity for citizens and the foundations of a peaceful society. So uh, you could read the conference uh, later on. And uh, let me tell you simply how this peace process, which is the only peace process in the world that uh, today has any high probability of being successful. We have in the world 22 armed conflicts going on, 22. And this is the only one that might be solved through a peaceful and uh, political negotiation. Uh, and it's the oldest, longest, and the only armed conflict in the whole of the Western Hemisphere. Why did I start and how did this start? I've been studying peace processes for many years. And we, when I discovered that you need a set of conditions. Why has so many attempts to negotiate peace with the FARC have failed? And uh, studying a, a peace process around the world and the peace processes with the FARC that many other presidents attempted, well, I discovered that there were a certain set of conditions that were not present and that were present at the beginning of my government. The first one is that you need the correlation of military forces, military correlation of forces to be in the favor of the state. If the guerrillas have in their favor the correlation of military forces, well, there's no real possibility of negotiating peace with them. We managed to change this correlation of forces in our favor. And uh, when I assumed the government, this was uh, a reality. A second condition in today's world <coughs> means is that <coughs> you need the support of the international community and the support of the region where you are trying to negotiate a conflict. This condition was not present before. This condition uh, was not present when I came into power, but I very rapidly created that condition <clears throat> by negotiating and uh, normalizing my relations, the relations of Colombia with our neighbors, with Venezuela, with Ecuador, with Latin America in general. And uh, we managed to have this sort of international backing. And the third condition that is needed in any peace process <clears throat> is that you need the commanders of the insurgency to realize that for them personally, it's a better business, it's more profitable to negotiate peace than continue the war. This again was not present before, and it became a reality in the recent past when we start uh, hitting what we call high value targets, which were the commanders of the FARC personally. We started to go after them personally and with a certain degree of effectiveness. So these three conditions that were not present before were present at the beginning of the process. And when I realized that we had the conditions, I took the step to start the process. At that time, I uh, called some people who had had real experience in peace processes. In, in different parts of the world. One of them is a, a good friend of 
Mr. Cotsworth, Shlomo Ben-Ami, former Minister of Foreign Relations of Israel. He was one of the architects of the Camp David Agreement between Palestine and Israel. I brought in a, a British called Jonathan Powell, who was the Chief of Staff of Tony Blair. He had been instrumental in the negotiations with the IRA. I brought in Joaquin Villalobos. He was a commander of the Salvadorian guerrillas and chief negotiator in the Salvadorian peace process. I brought in uh, the academy, uh, professor of Harvard, William Uri, who was a, in a way the successor of a great professor in Harvard called Roger Fisher, uh, who, has, who, who developed a very good and, and effective uh, theories about negotiating. So I called and I said, why don't you help me uh, take each step here in this process, uh, plan the process correctly, and they have been extremely, extremely helpful since the very beginning. I remember uh, one of them saying, you must put a condition. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And he explained why. He said, negotiating a peace process is never popular. It's much easier, and I can, I can prove that now uh, that I've been in, in, in both sides. It's much easier to lead and to, uh, to be in government in times of war than to lead in times of peace. Uh, it's much easier to make war than to make peace. To make war is very popular. You simply have to, if you, if you win, of course, because if you lose, it's not very popular. But uh, if, you, if you're winning, you just uh, show the trophies to the public, and the public will all applaud, and you rally the forces, and you continue. And I did that for when I was Minister of Defense before being President. That's why I'm President. I became very popular for minister, uh, Defense Minister, and uh, the people elect, elected me as President. But making peace is about changing the uh, way people think, about changing people who have suffered in the war, and uh, teach them to, for, to uh, forgive teach them to, to, to the power of and the necessity to reconcile. And so you need to lead in a different way. Uh, leading in times of war is very uh, vertical. Leading in times of peace or in a peace process is very horizontal. You have to, it's like when you have simultaneous chess games. You have to, to address different issues at a different time. And and uh, the mere fact, I remember Shlomo and the others saying, the mere fact that you're going to sit down with your enemies will be questioned. Because there's a, always, always, there's a group of people who think, no, you have to crush. You have to kill every one of them until the last one. You know? So this, the mere fact that you are going to sit with them is going to make you unpopular. But when you start, negotiating and start talking about benefits to the guerrilla, then you will become even more unpopular. Because the people will say, why, are, why is the president talking about giving them any benefits? These people are, have only kidnapped, uh, made all kinds of violent, atrocious acts, terrorism. Why should they get any benefits? And so it is very unpopular. So uh, what they advised me is try to keep the negotiation secret and tell the guerrillas that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And only when you have the final package, you can put it to the people and then they will decide. So we started with, the, with that condition. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And 
the agreement uh, must be secret until we finish. We also, and I was also advised, and we did that, more than 50% of any peace negotiation is the agenda. The agenda is crucial. And try to negotiate the agenda before you launch the process publicly. And uh, this is also a way to measure the real uh, intention of the FARC. If they this time really think they want peace, they will uh, abide by the rules and they will keep the negotiation confidential. If they're in the same game as they have played before, they've taken advantage of the negotiation, they will leak. They will, uh, they will not respect the conf confidentiality. So I told them, you want, you want to negotiate peace, make it absolutely confidential. And uh, we negotiated the agenda, five points in the agenda, and they never leaked anything, which for me was a important proof that they were well-intentioned. At this time, it was for real. Another very difficult decision that I had to take was, should I negotiate in the middle of the war, or should I accept a bilateral ceasefire? The FARC, the guerrillas, were pressing very much for a bilateral ceasefire. But the experiences we had in previous attempts with bilateral ceasefires had not been very positive. The FARC had been very good at taking advantage of the bilateral ceasefire to rearm, to get some oxygen, to strengthen themselves, both militarily and politically. So I said, no ceasefire. Another reason why I did not accept a ceasefire was, you will permit the FARC to be in the best of all worlds. They will be armed. They will be discussing with no military pressure. So there is a perverse incentive to prolong the negotiations forever. So I took this decision to uh, fight and talk at the same time. And I used the former Prime Minister of Israel, Rabin, who used a phrase when he was negotiating with Arafat. He said, I will negotiate peace with these terrorists as if there is no terrorism in my country. But I will go after terrorism in my country as if there is no peace negotiations where they were, held, where they were, where they were discussing. And I used a, s a similar phrase, and I started the peace talks in the middle of the war. Uh, and uh, then my advisor said, this is the most difficult and the most costly for you politically, because the people will give you uh, the benefit of the doubt for some time, but they will get tired of seeing a fundamental contradiction. They're seeing a peace process on the one hand, and the president talking about this peace process, but they're seeing war on the other hand. And then they're, start, they're going to start questioning your credibility, your, uh, your truthfulness, truthfulness, and uh, this is going to cost you politically. But it's the most effective way and the shortest to get to your port of destiny. So I said, let's go and take the step and take the shortest step. Um, that's how it started. We negotiated, we negotiated five points in the agenda. Uh, one is, has to do with rural development. The second has to do with political participation. The third has to do with drug trafficking. This is a especially important point. 
I insisted very much to put on the table on the negotiation this item of the, this, this subject because drug trafficking in Colombia has been the source of finance of every violent group that we have had in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, all our uh, violent groups, and we have, we have had and we still have many, are related one way or another to drug trafficking. We are the number one exporter, we still are, of cocaine to the world. And so, and the FARC has been the military uh, operation that has defended drug trafficking. And uh, they have uh, made it impossible for the military forces to eradicate drug trafficking from Colombia. And so, to convince them to switch sides, in a sense, and help us do away, because they have always said that they are not drug traffickers. They say they benefit from drug trafficking, they finance themselves with drug trafficking, but they are not drug traffickers. They, they, they say they don't get rich themselves, they finance their military operations with drug money. Uh, so I, I insisted to put this item in the agenda, uh, and uh, the other item was the other two subjects in the agenda were victims, the rights of the victims, the right to justice, to the truth, to reparations, and no repetition. These are the rights that are included in what today is called the transitional justice, which is a new sort of international law concept to facilitate peace processes around the world and is, is under the umbrella of the Treaty of Rome. The International Criminal Court uh, has to do with this transitional court, and, and we decided, and I decided, to put the victims, for the first time ever any country has ever done this, to put the victims in the center of the solution of this conflict and their rights. Uh, because we have had so many victims, more than seven and a half million victims, because it's been such a long conflict, more than 50 years, that I thought it would give much more credibility and more, much more legitimacy to put the victims in the center of the solution. And the fifth point is what you call DDR. This is sort of standard procedure in any peace process. What is DDR? It's demobilization, disarmament, and the R starts for reintegration of the armed group into civil society. And so those were the five points in the agenda. We started negotiating the first one, the second one. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm only going to say we negotiate something that is completely sensible. We didn't give away our our economic model or our investment uh, policy. Or we negotiated something that we had to do regardless of the FARC. With or without FARC, we, had to, we have to invest more in the rural areas. We have to invest more uh, in public goods in the rural areas. We have to give more access to the peasants, to, to, to the land, and we have to give them the technical and uh, financial help for them to become productive. It's something that we had to do anyways. And in the political participation, what we negotiated was what any democracy does every now and then to be able to maintain the, the democracy. Democracy is full of, of, of uh, uh, faults. That's why Churchill used to say it's uh, the worst of all systems except any other system. Uh, and so you have to continue uh, reviving, uh, revising the democracies as, as in any institution. You have to accommodate yourself to changing circumstances. That's what we're doing, giving more rights to the opposition, giving more rights to uh, peoples or regions that have not had enough representation in, in our Congress or in our uh, 
centers of decision, and that's what we negotiated. In the drug trafficking, we negotiated uh, virtually that the FARC will help us now in the illegal crop substitution and in doing away with drug trafficking in Colombia. Uh, and just imagine for, for 30 seconds what this means, what this means for, for New York, for the U.S., for Mexico, for Central America, or for London or Madrid that where the consumption of drugs is going up. That the, the number one exporter of cocaine uh, change, is going to be able for the first time to really uh, address the issue of the exportation and production of drugs of cocaine uh, in the world. And uh, we have been negotiating the fourth item. We already negotiated the, the uh, right to truth. We negotiated a truth commission. The reparations is almost finished. We start repairing victims even before this conflict was over. We have repaired already the Colombian state more than half a million victims at a, vi a very high cost. People ask me, why did you do that? Why did you start repairing victims before the conflict was over? Because, and I said, because we need so to start healing the wounds of this war as soon as possible. Otherwise, this tremendous effort to reconcile would be very difficult. And so we started even before we ended the conflict. And the breakthrough that we managed to get last week in Havana, in Cuba, is the item of justice, which is the most difficult uh, item in any peace process. The most difficult negotiation has to do with justice. Where do you draw the line between peace and justice. If you ask a victim, a normal victim, they will always say this line has to be more towards justice. I want more justice. If you ask a future victim, where do you want the, the, long, the line drawn? They will always say, no, no, I want to more peace because I don't want to be a future victim. So it's it's a negotiation that, in this case, we had to take into account our international obligations, the fact that we become and we are a part of the Treaty of Rome, our legal obligations internationally, our legal obligations nationally. We have a constitution which, for example, forbids amnesties as we've seen them before. We have to take into account international public opinion. We have to take into account Colombian public opinion. And at the same time, strike a deal that is acceptable to the FARC. So to square that circle is, was very difficult and was the most in, difficult item in the whole negotiation. And that's what we achieved last week. We managed to create a system a transitional justice system with a tribunal where the most responsible, because you can't try everything, every member of the FARC, this would simply, simply physically impossible, but you get the most responsible and they go through a process where they are investigated, they are judged by a special tribunal, they are then condemned and sentenced. So they go through the transitional justice system. So there is no impunity. And this conforms by far with the international standards. And that was a major breakthrough that we achieved uh, last week because the FARC had resisted. They said with good, re with good arguments, why should we be the first guerrilla group in the history of the world that we're going to lay down our arms and be sentenced. Oh, so why lay down our arms? We had to explain to them that if they wanted to really 
participate in politics, they had to do, and they had to go through a justice system, because that's the, the new way, the, the new rules of the game in today's world. But we were able to achieve that last week. What is left? Uh, the DDR, where I put, for the first time also, five generals of my army and uh, one admiral in, in, in active service to be the ones who negotiate that. You know, where, how is the bilateral ceasefire going to be implemented? How is the FARC going to disarm? And how are they going to be reincorporated into civil and normal life? Uh, this is what is left. We also imposed on ourselves a deadline. It has to be over by, at, at the latest, six months from now, the 23rd of March. So we have to hurry up. Uh, and uh, if we are able to finish, and I'm sure we will, uh, then Colombia will have peace for the first time in 51 years. And this is going to be a game changer for our country. The cost of this war has been enormous in economic terms, in social terms, um, families that have been ruptured, uh, broken, uh, wounds that have been opened for many, many years. Now we can claim, hopefully, and I said this at the United Nations General Assembly, next year I hope to come here and say, I am a president of a normal country, a country in peace. And uh, that's what we have uh, achieved so far. Um, this is, has been difficult. Um, as I said at the beginning, making peace is much more difficult than making war. Um, there are enemies of the process always. In every peace process, some, some groups uh, start complaining, you have not done enough. These people have to be punished even more. Uh, they invent whatever reason they find. But if you have very clear, and I must say the, these international advisors have been so helpful in, in, man, in helping me man, maintain the course, and you're clear and you persevere, then at the end, things will, will uh, function uh, in the correct manner. And that's what I hope that we can uh, achieve in less than six months. Uh, peace in Colombia has a tremendous repercussion for the whole region because this conflict has affected the whole region. And the region has realized this. That's why the region as a whole, with no exceptions, have supported this process since the very beginning. Uh, this has been very useful. I have big differences with, with Venezuela, with the Venezuelan regime. We have uh, completely different visions, but I must say they have helped me in the peace process, uh, as all the countries in uh, Latin America. And I said the U.S. is completely committed. They, they uh, send a special envoy, because for the U.S. it's also a success, it's a success story. Fifteen years ago, Colombia was about to be declared a failed state. And uh, President Clinton went to Colombia with the Republicans. The Speaker of the House was a Republican, Speaker Hastert, and launched Plan Colombia to save Colombia's democracy, to give us the instruments and the tools to become a, uh, a viable democracy. Well, 15 years, years later, we can say we are the country who's growing the fastest in Latin America, of medium size or, or the larger size economy. We are the country who's reducing poverty more than any other country, or extreme poverty more than any other country. We have created more employment than any other country, and that still in the middle of the war. Imagine what we can do if we don't have this war. And for the U.S., 
this is probably the most successful bipartisan foreign pol policy initiative and uh, a peace process is like the cherry on the cake. That's why uh, President Obama yesterday said, you have my absolute full support and we will continue to support you in the post-conflict. Uh, and it's something that we appreciate, we need, because this is a success not only for Colombia, but for the whole region. And I hope that if I come back to uh, Columbia University, I can then come back and say, uh, we have ended the conflict. We are Colombia with the O is a is a country in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think this uh, uh, more informal presentation uh, of the uh, Colombian peace process, I think, has been highly appreciated by everyone here. It was also clear uh, and short <laughs> for the, you know, the complexity of, of the process. Um, uh, we're not now going to have this uh, very sh small panel um, uh, with two of my colleagues and myself. <laughs> Uh, from, you know, uh, uh, so we will start with uh, Professor Maria Victoria Murillo from uh, the Department of Political Science and the School of International and Public Affairs. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you at this great moment. One of the things that really struck me of your presentation is the tension between the fact that to be able to achieve, you know, we've sa you said many times this failed, it worked this time because we were winning the war. And, and so you are winning the war, but you, and that changed the incentives of the FARC, obviously, because they're losing, but you had the magnanimity of not crushing them or defeating them. That may have a political cost, because if you were winning the war, you could have won the war. That's a very good reflection, but let me, let me explain. In today's world, what, what is called the asymmetrical wars, uh, it's very difficult to uh, crush the enemy, to disappear the last guerrilla. It's almost virtually impossible, especially in a country where the geography is ideal for guerrilla warfare, where you have drug trafficking, so you have a source of finance. Uh, and, uh, and in general, asymmetrical wars end through negotiations. And, uh, but you have to find the right condition. And this is a, a basic but very important, simple military concept. When you're in war and you want to end the war and you're winning, you have to build, they call it, a, a, a golden bridge for your enemy to uh, retire with dignity or to end this war with dignity. And so I had very, this in mind very much. Um, it's 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 a very at a very little cost because people say, but sacrificing sacrificing part of the justice is it not is it, is that not a very high cost? And I say, no. When you compare that to the cost of continuing the war, so to give them to build for them this golden bridge is a very, very cheap, for the Colombian society, way to end this war. Thank you. Um, and, 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 I mean, I totally agree that the cost of continuous violence, violence it's, it's crucial for the equation. But uh, going to the other side, uh, the kind of, the, there are two crucial things to this agreement. One is, as you said, justice. This is the first time both justice and tr truth are combined, so they need to, to also 
uh, provide truth about what have they done. But there's also a, a, a very innovative component, which is this idea of reparation to the victims, that justice is not just going to be uh, losing the privation of, of freedom, but also actions that are going to repair the damage that they have done. So can you talk more about that aspect of the agreement? Because I think institutionally it's a crucial innovation. You, and you just, word, you just uh, mentioned the magic word, innovation. And it is an innovation. This is unprecedented in peace processes, and that's why it has gotten so much interest and so much support. The former prosecutor general of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, he was Argentinian, Luis Moreno, <laughs> uh, he said this is a piece of art. This is going to be used as a, as a reference for future conflicts because you did many things which are unprecedented. For example, it's the first time ever that in a peace process, the two parties uh, involved agree in the constitution of a special judicial jurisdiction and a special tribunal before the conflict is ended. In the other peace process, it, it is imposed afterwards. Uh, and this is a major breakthrough. So uh, we, in that discussion, said, OK, sentencing, what kind of sentence? And, uh, and there are different types of sentence. You, you talk to uh, your and our very beloved pope and the church, they have a concept of more uh, justicia restaurativa, justicia reparadora. Uh, that Restorative peace. More than punitive. But you need the punitive element. So what did we do? We combined the three. And the sentences would have a component of punitive uh, sentence or sanction by, and the phrase was, effective restriction of liberty, but also a restorative and a repairing element. They have to do work. They have to go and repair the communities that were destroyed, or they have to go and demine, and they have to do reparative and restorative work, plus an element of punitive sentence. So this is also a very, very uh, unique innovation. OK, um, Mr. President, now we shift to Professor Christopher Sabatini, from, also from the School of International and Public Affairs. First of all, President, congratulations. I think uh, the whole world, many of us, sighed a huge, a huge sigh of relief when we saw you uh, shaking hands with a FARC in Havana. Um, congratulations, and not just for having secured it, but for your courage in going through with it. I mean, when you took this on, I think everyone knew the, the risk you were taking, both political, personal, and I think it's, uh, it's a great moment, so congratulations. I have a two-part question. Uh, in the, since the signing of the uh, agreement, um, there have arrived a number, risen a series of different interpretations. Um, Timochenko, the leader of the FARC, has uh, disagreed with some of the interpretations of the peace agreement. Um, the Fiscal General of Colombia has asserted that maybe this could lead to uh, the prosecution of former presidents. Um, and then human rights groups are also claiming that uh, for all the very beneficial things that you talked about, restorative justice as well as punitive justice, that uh, the special tribunal runs the risk of violating norms in the U UN and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights that they've established that punishment should be equal to the gravity of that task. So two questions. One is, uh, when do you plan to make it public so we can avoid the back and forth of interpretation in the open air? And the second is, what is your interpretation of Human Rights Watch and others' um, claims that this justice system or tribunal will be too soft? Okay. Um, you're, you're a professor of international relations? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and most of the students here uh, probably know that the best agreement is the one that where, never, where everybody is unhappy. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good agreement. When you draw the line between peace and justice, 
by definition, they're going to be unhappy people from one side and from the other. So I was aware that some people would be unhappy. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, on the one side, uh, Human Rights Watch, and on the other side, my predecessor, Uribe, are both mad. And I'm very happy because they are the worst enemies among themselves. And that uh, gives me a, a tremendous peace of mind that I did well. If I can just say one thing. <laughs> If I could just say one thing, I, I know you're a, you're a huge follower of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and aspire to the, much the same type of leader. He once said, judge me not by my friends, but by my enemies. You've made good enemies. And uh, um, of course that people will, will, will object to certain things, uh, no agreements, especially so complex as this one will satisf satisfy everybody. Uh, Human Rights Watch and Mr. Vivanco, he, his whole reason to be, reason to exist is we must defend the, the rights of the victims uh, and we must punish the perpetrators, the violators of these rights. And he will always be pulling for more and more in his direction. It's, it's norm, normal, it's natural, it's his, it's his job. They pay him for that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uribe, well, he doesn't want the peace process because he lives out of manipulating fear and the war is the best uh, environment to create fear. If we have peace, that raw material, his political raw material will disappear. So he will always uh, find a reason to object. Uh, so we'll, you will always have these type of enemies. I had a professor of uh, international law, very well respected. Uh, he's a professor of Notre Dame University, American. I included him in my delegation when they went to, to strike this deal, this legal the, the justice aspect. I went and I asked him, uh, please, you are going to be my monitor, my, my verifier, that everything we do will be up to the standards of the international community, the international rule of law. Uh, I don't want uh, tomorrow that uh, the international community is going to uh, say, no, uh, we don't accept that. And what we agreed goes even beyond those minimum standards of the international community. Uh, just uh, uh, an hour before this meeting, uh, one of the many centers of international peace called El Centro de Toledo para la Paz, they did a, a big uh, discussion of what we achieved and they said this complies uh, much more than we had expected with the international standards. So I'm very confident that there is no impunity, there is going to be justice ap applied, uh, the most responsible will be investigated, will be judged, will be condemned and will be sentenced, which is the basis for any just, uh, justice system. So you will always find uh, uh, different interpretations. You said Timochenko uh, said, well, we are interpreting this uh, this way, we are interpreting uh, this the other way, says the government. This is normal in these type of negotiations. Uh, Kissinger used to say, uh, there are sometimes you need to uh, construct, uh, const to, to apply constructive ambiguity. But in this case, there is not even ambiguity. Uh, there might be difference in, in appreciation, which will be settled, uh, quite frankly, very fast. Uh, but uh, since everybody is trying to claim victory in, with this breakthrough, well, it's normal that one, one set of people say this, one set of people interpret the other way, but it's a normal procedure in processes of this sort.
Uh, Mr. President, I, I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, maybe uh, the audience uh, wants to listen from you about the negotiations with the Ejército de Liberación Nacional that you didn't refer to uh, in your presentation. Uh, and, and the second is a question of an economist, but perhaps you should go with the one. No, I, I, would, be, I would be very frank with you. Uh, Remember I told you that we started the negotiations with the FARC uh, in, the, in a secret uh, component. The first part was going to be completely confidential. We will not tell anybody about this negotiation. We didn't tell anybody until we made it public in Oslo, in Norway. Uh, that was almost three years ago. And uh, we are in that secret stage with the ELN. So, Please forgive me, but I cannot give you any details. I would be breaking my word and the rules I imposed. So the only thing I can tell you is we are talking, but I cannot give any details. And forgive me, but it's the rules that I, I <laughs> imposed on the other process. So I would be sort of uh, uh, breaking my own rules. So the ELN, I hope that they realize that uh, the train of peace uh, is for them also and that they will speed up things. But I, I will say that uh, and no more. Okay, Mr. President, the other is uh, the question of an economist in, in the group, uh, professors here. But the, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the implementation of the peace process uh, is going to coincide with a much more difficult economic uh, conjuncture uh, you know, uh, although Colombia uh, is doing better, uh, certainly than the other South American countries, uh, in any case, the, the abundance that they characterize the, uh, let's say, the last decade in terms of resources uh, is going to be much more limited. To what extent do you see a tension between the, uh, the uh, you know, the implementation of the peace process and the, particularly the fiscal constraints uh, including, of course, the more limited resources and the fiscal responsibility law? Well, first of all, some people are concerned uh, and raise the question, the cost of peace. They say, how much is peace going to cost us? Uh, a very simple answer to that is, the cost of war is much, much higher in, in, in every respect to the cost of peace. So uh, simply compare yourself where you are and will, where will you be in peace and if, if war continues. That's a, a plus. It's a tremendous benefit. Now, of course, we have to do some action. We have to take, do, uh, we have to implement the agreements. Uh, how much is that going to cost? It's not going to cost a lot. I will give you uh, some examples. Today, the FARC has around uh, 8,000 people in arms. They say between six and 8,000. Um, how much is, is it going to cost to demobilize them? Well, we have already demobilized more than 53,000 combatants of the paramilitaries or the guerrillas. So to absorb 8,000 is relatively easy. We know how to do it, and it's not going to be very costly. Uh, what about uh, the uh, investment in uh, public goods in the rural areas? Well, you know better than I, uh, Jose Antonio, you know our rural areas much better than I do. Uh, that we have to do those investments regardless of we have FARC or not. And we will do it at the rhythm that our fiscal responsibility will allow us. Uh, and the message here is I have learned that uh, fiscal responsibility and the viability of the economy is a very, very important asset and the confidence of the international markets in the Colombian economy is a big asset. And I will not risk that by doing irresponsible things. 
I, I will go as fast as possible that the fiscal situation allows me. And we still have a margin of maneuver. As you say, we are growing more than the rest of the region. We will, we're going through difficult times, but that doesn't mean we don't have the resources to, to implement the agreements. Okay, uh, Mr. President, now we, we are going to give the opportunity to some of the, uh, the audience, uh, including uh, notably uh, in, and in particular the students who want to ask questions to, uh, to do so. Uh, there are going to be microphones on, the, on both sides, so uh, 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 those who want to speak, uh, please uh, line. Uh, we have, of course, a limited amount <laughs> of time, so let, let's start with the, the right-hand side. Hello, good afternoon, President. Um, my name is Juan Londoño, my PhD candidate at the School of Engineering and Applied Science, and uh, thank you very much for being here. I should first congratulate you and thank you for the positive and definite steps given last week for the Peace of Colombia. It is perhaps these steps that allow me to ask about a different but not so tangential topic. In the U.S., research universities, scientists, professors, students and research groups rely to the great extent on governmental resources from National Science Foundation and others. And I see with great concern the systematic budget reductions to the NSF equivalent Department of Science and Technology called CNCS. With budget reductions around 9% in 2015 and the proposed 30% for 2016, I was hoping you could share with me your visions on the role that science and research play on your general plan for Columbia. Many fellow scientists sitting here today are deciding whether to become faculties at Columbia Colombian institutions, whether we can propose solutions for coffee or flower industry byproducts or create tailored solutions in social, human and agricultural scientists, pivotal for a post-conflict. Thank you very much again for your visit. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Um, I, I have heard this concern not only in the technology, applied sciences uh, and uh, research and development area, but in many areas. We, we had to do uh, an across-the-board reduction uh, in order to uh, be able to maintain the viability of our economy and to adjust to the new situation. But as uh, the demonstration of, that, the, of my commitment to education and uh, research and uh, development is that probably one of the most important constitutional reforms that we approved during my first government had to do with how you distribute royalties. And for the first time, by constitution, 10% of all the royalties that are produced in Colombia will go directly to research, development, and innovation. Colciencias is the Secretary General of the system that distributes these funds. We have education as a top priority, as uh, you probably have heard me. I have a vision for my country that has three pillars. I want a country in peace. I want a country more, with more social justice and a country better educated. This year, for the first time, in decades, the budget for education is bigger than the budget for military expenditure. And we're still, we're still at war. So that will show you my commitment to the concerns you have, which are real. And to all the students who are studying and going back, please do. We need you. We need you, and I'm sure that we're going to take off as never before, with this, after we start constructing our peace. Yeah, please. Yep. Dear President Santos, thanks a lot for coming here today and congratulations on your efforts um, um, at the peace talks with the FARC. Um, I'm Marcel, I'm a first year student here at the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, my question is directed on the issue of DDR that you also mentioned uh, earlier in your talk. One important aspect of DDR is integration 
And uh, one important aspect of this is creating opportunities. So um, how and in what sectors, for example, in the employment uh, sector, do you plan to create opportunities uh, for the career? As, as I told you, we have already demobilized more than 53,000. We have a system whereby we, we uh, give them their sort of their welcome. We put them through the system, the system depending on how much uh, help they, they need. Some of them need uh, to learn how to read and write. They have, been, they have, they have been born in the guerrillas. They have not, they have uh, not known anything but uh, how to sh shoot an AK-47, and you have to retrain them. And uh, we have the system working; it's working quite well uh, with the private sector. The private sector has been part of the system, and we were we have been able to absorb. And something that we have already done. Uh, in a way we're saving a lot of time is the the private sector uh, has already understood that incorporating former guerrillas uh, has no danger they're not going to kidnap them or whatever they they have learned through the system that this is a good thing uh, and uh, <coughs> if we have created three million new jobs in the last five years to create 8,000 is, is very, very uh, easy. Now, um, I can see uh, some guerrillas wanting to, for example, there is a very high, wh where are you from? Uh, Germany. Germany. Uh, in your country and in today's world, and this is one of the big discussions in the UN today, uh, the environment, climate change. Colombia is a very, very rich country in biodiversity, the richest in the world per square kilometer. We have rainforest and uh, water uh, sources as few countries in the world. We need to protect that. The gorillas have been in the jungle all their lives. Well, for them to become like forest rangers, this is an ideal type of, of work and they have said they would like that. So there, there are many opportunities uh, for them, and as I say, the, the numbers that we handle vis-a-vis -vis the number that we, we will have to handle are very easily managed. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Alexandra Patti. I'm studying Master in Science in Urban Planning. Um, you say that the international support was a key component to resolve the, the conflict in Colombia. I'm wondering why does the Colombia government not have a stronger position against the democratic crisis in Venezuela? Uh, the consequence of that silence um, has been shown in the border crisis we just had and the constant proof of cooperation between the government of Venezuela and FARC. We have never uh, denied the tremendous differences we have with Venezuela. Uh, I was one of the, the uh, Chavez's worst enemies for many years. He had declared me his enemy number one and vice versa. When I was elected, I said to myself, I'm not a journalist anymore, I'm not a minister of defense anymore, I'm the president of 48 million Colombians or at that time 46 million. And uh, I have a border with Venezuela, it's 2,200 kilometers, it's a live border. And uh, the most sensible thing to do in international relations, you are a professor of international relations, is to try to get along with your neighbors. So I called Chavez and invited him to Colombia. And we sat down, like you and I are here. And I said to him, listen, you and I think differently about almost everything. Uh, I don't like your Bolivarian revolution, and you probably don't like my system of government and my economic model. But let's respect our differences and try to work together on those issues that will be of mutual benefit to your country and my country. And we 
we managed to do that until he died. And Maduro inherited that in a way. And he has been handling uh, what happened uh, some weeks ago was completely unacceptable for Colombia. He closed his border, which he has the right to do. He uh, deported Colombians that are, were illegally there, which he has the right to do. What he does not have the right to do is to mistreat and violate the human rights of my compatriots. And that's why we said this is absolutely unacceptable and we protested. I told him directly in his face in the meeting we had last week, this is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, if you want to uh, collaborate in the border to, to go after the smuggling or the criminal bands, the best thing is not to close the border but to work together. He said he was going to investigate the human rights violations. We have already uh, denounced that in the proper institutions. This has ceased, it has stopped. Fortunately, we have not had m more violations of our compatriots. And we have been uh, uh, trying to handle this, this uh, relation with the utmost uh, prudence and whatever uh, disagreements we have, we do, we do, we express them through private and diplomat diplomatic channels. We have expressed many disagreements, things that have happened in Venezuela through those channels, not through the television or the press, because we know that this is the way uh, to create more trouble than to fix things. We have been promoting, for example, the dialogue between the government and opposition. the opposition. We have failed, unfortunately. This is the only way I think that uh, Venezuela could start uh, resolving their problems. But uh, uh, that's the way we have handled this situation with uh, Venezuela so far. And I think uh, this is the most sensible, least costly way to handle a, 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 such a difficult relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. Uh, General President, uh, my name is Ricardo Jaramillo. Um, I'm a freshman in the college, and my question is actually about Venezuela as well. Uh, Nicolás Maduro is a dictator in Venezuela who uh, has committed various human rights abuses against his own people and will continue to do so. Um, you say that you are willing to work with Nicolás Maduro on these issues. Um, but it seems as if there is a lack of uh, recognition that Nicolás Maduro is um, the problem and his regime is the problem um, insofar as uh, there is a chance for a solution. So my question is, uh, when many in Venezuela came to you uh, asking for you to denounce Maduro as a human rights violator, um, one of the things that we heard not just from you but from um, other leaders in Latin America was you know, a silence and unwillingness to um, combat him on that, on that, on that, on that charge. So uh, my question is, um, can, we, can we ever expect, um, can, can the Venezuelan opposition count on you as an ally um, in that regard, and can we hope for you to take a somewhat tougher stance against the dictatorship um, in Venezuela? Listen, in, um, in situations like, like these, uh, we have, uh, address these problems with the Venezuelan government. We are in constant communication with different sectors of the Venezuelan society. Uh, they have even asked us, listen, try to calm things down. Uh, we are the ones who uh, are the least interested in, in falling into provocations because that's what some people want. Uh, Maduro has told us has accused me of uh, trying to uh, destroy his Bolivarian revolution. Uh, I have said to him in public and in private, uh, don't accuse me of trying to destroy the Bolivarian revolution. The Bolivarian revolution is, is destroying itself. And don't accuse Colombia of being responsible for the problems in Venezuela, for not having the basic food for their people or the inflation that is more than 200% or the exchange rate that is uh, official 6th 
30 and the exchange rate is more than 700. These are not problems made in Colombia. Those are problems made in Venezuela. So don't accuse Colombians uh, when, uh, for your own problems. We have told them that in public and in private. We have also uh, said to him, we can work together in those things that I think could, could uh, um, help us uh, in our common problems, which I think is the sensible thing to do, is what uh, uh, Gorbachev and uh, Reagan did in, 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 in that era, or whatever two sensible countries do uh, that have different visions and different ways of, of, of thinking. And so we have to manage that situation. Uh, you say, should I ally myself with the opposition? Uh, no country allies itself with the opposition of any other country in the sense that uh, we, we uh, respect the internal affairs of the country. This is a basic international principle. You might have uh, your heart with one or, 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 or with the other. But can you imagine how I would react if any country would then ally myself, ally itself officially with the opposition of Colombia? That would be completely unacceptable. So there are some certain international principles and standards that one must follow in order. This is not a perfect world, but uh, I have to follow those standards, and that's why I have to manage the situation uh, in a way that will avoid as much conflict as possible. Yes, please. Presidente Santos, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alexis Komnenos, and I'm, I'm an MA student here at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights. And um, my question is about the transitional justice process. As you said, um, the idea is to put the victims at the center of it, which I think is a very important point. Um, and you said yourself that um, some of the guerrilleros and guerrilleras were born in the jungle and have been in the guerrillas since they were children. So will those people not be considered victims of the war as well? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have the answer. Will, will the, 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 the kids that were born in the guerrillas, would, would they be victims? Kidnapped yes. as well. Uh, as, as kids that have been kidnapped, uh, uh, well, the perpetrators of that will be by far, but, but, but this is an, uh, a good, a good uh, question that I I have to go back and study that. They, they, they might. They might, uh, they might be victims of the conflict. They are. I mean, if they, if they were unwillingly kidnapped and taken there, they, they are victims, of course. But good question. Okay. Mr. President, we'll take the, actually the last question because of your other commitments today. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you for being here. I am a sophomore at the Columbia College studying political science, and my question is the following. Um, a 2014 regional report <clears throat> on human rights and development of Latin America from the United Nations reported that Latin America was the only region in, in the globe that had an increase in homicides. And my question is in regards to this. Um, um, you mentioned how Latin America um, backed your support of uh, the peace negotiations, and I just wanted to know, um, do you see a future cooperation between the Latin American continent to not only solve and crack down on crime, but also um, go against the underlying problems of crime, like economic inequality and political underrepresentation? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Colombia, for example, we have the lowest homicide uh, figures in the last 40 years. Um, we've been decreasing and we still have to decrease it even more because not only Colombia, the Latin America in general has very high homicide rates. Uh, inequality in Colombia. We were the second most unequal country five years ago after Haiti. We put in place some well-focused policies to fight against poverty and against extreme poverty. We brought down poverty by 12%. 4,400,000 Colombians went out of poverty. And something similar in extreme poverty, from almost 14% to less than 
8 percent. Two million and a half Colombians went out of extreme poverty. We still are, uh, we're now on average for Latin America, but we still are a very unequal country. So all of us, Colombia and Latin America, we have to persevere there. And these are, are um, subjects that are interrelated. Um, poverty and uh, inequality, and inequality and uh, crime, they're, they're, they're not independent, they are related. And that's why uh, economic development and, and inclusive growth is so important. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And I think that if peace is finally reached, it will be much easier, at least for the Colombians, to advance much further and much faster in the achievement of that country that I want in peace with more social justice and better educated. Because, for example, where is poverty and extreme poverty concentrated? In the rural areas, more than in the suburbs or more in, than in the cities. So, and why has, has the state failed to address the poverty and extreme poverty in the rural areas? Among many reasons, because of the conflict. So if you do away with the conflict, if you finish the conflict, then it would be much easier. And the social return of the investment in the rural areas in, in those terms will be much, much higher. Gracias, señor presidente. Okay, Mr. President, uh, let me say in the name of the students, uh, the name of the professors, and of course the president and the provost, thank you very much for having come to the uh, World Series Forum this year. Uh, let me say, of course, as a Colombian citizen, that I, I really hope uh, this uh, succeeds. Uh, and, uh, and let me say also uh, uh, thanks to the, all the government officials that have been with you today, uh, the, foreign, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the permanent representative of Colombia to the United Nations, and the ambassador of uh, Colombia to the United States, among others. Thank you very much. And thank you, all the students. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats as we escort the president and his delegation out of the building. Thank you.